Thinking Aloud, conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with parapsychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we'll be exploring shamanism and psychology. My guest is Professor Jurgen Kramer. He's a professor of psychology at Santa Rosa Junior College, former dean of faculty and vice president of academic affairs at the Saybrook Institute. He is also the executive editor of Revision, the Journal of Consciousness and Transformation. He is co-author with River Jackson Patton of Ethno- Autobiography, Stories and Practices for Unlearning Whiteness, Decolonization, and Uncovering Ethnicities. Jurgen is based in California, and now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, Jurgen. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you so much for having me and inviting me to, for the, to this conversation. Greatly appreciate it. We'll be talking about shamanism and psychology, and it's an interesting topic because I'm under the impression that, at least in previous generations, there was sort of an antagonism between these two disciplines. Psychologists, anthropologists, social scientists tended to look down on shamans. Yes, I think that's uh, very true. The history uh, of research in shamanism illustrates that very well. Shamanism, which is really a Western construct that started with ethnographers traveling to Siberia and finding these people that looked weird, that looked bizarre, that did strange things that they uh, couldn't uh, comprehend. So they were confronted with this phenomenon which they tried to investigate. And they try to understand it and thought about it as, you know, is this schizophrenia? Are they crazy in one form or another? And that is a question that up to today, there are publications that are asking, you know, should shamans be diagnosed with some disorder, bipolar, schizophrenia, something else, something uh, psychotic? So that's the where the history started, and psychology, for many, many years, didn't really have much of an interest in it. The diagnoses were all psychiatric, um, and the um, anthropology had an interest in, in trances, in altered uh, states of consciousness. So eventually... Anthropologists came up with the definition that a shaman is someone, and the M-A-N in shaman really doesn't refer to any gender. It refers, uh, you know, it's a Tungus and Nivenki word. It can be a man, it can be a woman, depending on tradition, and in many traditions there, there were both, um, is someone who can alter their state of consciousness for and use it for the benefit of others, for healing, for finding lost objects, anything of that nature. Now, this definition, which comes out of the uh, observations with Siberian tribes, Siberian uh, traditions where uh, shamanism is culturally situated, then was generalized by um, anthropologists to many other traditions. So anybody who looked a little bit like, yeah, this person is altering their state of consciousness, they were labeled shamans. But shamanism is a Western contra construct, which really properly can only be used with the Evenki, which is where it originated. But it uh, since then became, you know, applied to practitioners that work for the benefit of their communities all over the world. And as some traditions like the term, some people really dislike the term, so it depends on who you are talking about. But shamanism is something that is, as a phenomenon, is worldwide, 
But really, when we look at it very closely, each tradition has their own terminology that refers to how they do shamanism. Shamanism is always culturally specific and connected with the local situation, the local community, the local ecology. Um, so that's very, very uh, important. I'm under the impression, Jürgen, from uh, having watched one of your performances, uh, uh, combining le a lecture with drumming and, and chanting, that you would consider yourself something of a shaman. Well, I consider myself a shamanic a practitioner. For me, that distinction is very uh, important. Shamanic practitioner means that I'm using shamanic uh, approaches. But I would not presume to be a shaman. One thing that I want to emphasize and add to the definition is that shamans are communally acknowledged. Other people in the village, in the tribe, in the clan, acknowledge that there is a person who has a special gift. Now, I've come to the understanding based on my research and reading in psychology that what happens in trances is actually something that can facilitate learning and integration in all of us. Because we all can go into altered states, which doesn't mean that we're all shamans. Everybody can play the violin. Not everybody is a Yehudi Minuin. So we can all practice it, we can all use it, but that doesn't mean that we're experts and you know, work in a particular tradition. And I don't have a particular tradition. I'm, so to speak, recovering my tradition by having worked with Sami people in the Arctic North, by working with the old Germanic traditions. So I'm trying to establish a cultural context for myself. But I haven't had any elders. I have not been initiated in that way. Even though, you know, other people have worked with me in ceremony, initiated me into certain uh, things, but that doesn't make me a shaman. It would be presumptuous of me to claim that. I think it's fair to say that th there is something you might call a, a shamanistic worldview. I think sometimes called animism. The idea that the, the world that we experience is not just a material world. It is populated by spiritual entities who interact with us all the time. In fact, I go even further and say that just as Western psychologists and behavioral scientists think of some shamans as being mentally ill, shamanic practitioners often think that people that we diagnose as having mental illness are really experiencing spiritual ailments. So here we're getting into a very uh, complex topic. You're absolutely right. In indigenous traditions that, you know, have shamanic practices, if you don't see or recognize spirits, there's something wrong with, uh, with you. In our world, if you talk to things that are not there and a psychiatrist might see you, then you might be diagnosed as psychotic of some form or another. So there's a big discrepancy in worldviews. In shamanic traditions, you know, the community and the practitioners can distinguish between people, and, and there is evidence for that in the uh, research literature, they can distinguish between somebody who is getting initiated into, a, a shop, into becoming a shaman and who goes through experiences that are psychotic-like on the surface of things and members of the community who are going through severe psychological suffering that we might call a psychosis. And of course, one major difference being uh, the one group, uh, the, the ones, the shamans that are getting initiated, they function well in everyday life, ultimately. And the ones um, uh, who are not getting initiated, who are going through severe psychological suffering, they don't function so well in everyday life. <laughs> 
Well, when I was an undergraduate studying clinical psychology, they said the, the one requirement to have a, a, a diagnosis of mental illness is that you need to be suffering. If you're not suffering, then no matter what other symptoms you have, it would be a mistake to suggest that you, you have a mental illness. Yes. Subjective suffering is definitely one of the criteria. However, I want to point out that shamanic in initiations can involve suffering. And, you know, using uh, the, the, the language of, of Gurdjieff here in uh, the fourth way, it's intentional suffering. Right. When somebody goes out on, on a vision fast, well, people are fasting for four days. That's a certain level of suffering in initiations. Other forms of suffering, being tied up, uh, et cetera, et cetera, are part of the initiatory process. But this is intentional suffering that is part of a ritual, part of a ritual container. When somebody suffers from a mental illness, then that suffering is out of control and the person cannot say associate feelings and cognitions, uh, cannot hold their world together, does not function well in everyday life and does not have that level of control. One of the things that is noteworthy and, uh, you know, I've, I've observed this, say, with Rolling Thunder, um, you know, who was an expert uh, shaman or medicine person, intertribal uh, medicine person. He did his work and during the day he worked on the railroads, right? He held a job. He was functional in everyday life. And then he also did his healing work for the benefit of his community. There's also a condition um, known as mania. It's often related to a bipolar disorder, but I've known of people who seem to be manic all the time. And, you know, you could say they're in a state of ecstasy, but I often wonder whether that isn't, even though they seem on the surface to be very, very happy, uh, they may also be suffering from a mental illness. They may. Now, um, I want to going back to the question that you answer uh, that you asked earlier and sort of building on what you're asking now. Uh, the question is when somebody has certain experiences that are on the face of it unusual, then um, what is the cultural container for that? What can hold that? Right? So in our culture, if somebody has what in other cultures might be called visions, they would be hallucinations or delusions or something of that nature. In an indigenous or native culture, that might be seen as a sign that the person is going through an initiation, that there is a spiritual calling. And then there is a cultural container that helps integrate these experiences. Remember, part of the definition of becoming a shaman and being a shaman is that you can control going into these states, going in and uh, going out. When somebody is going through psychotic experiences, there isn't uh, that control. And if somebody goes to a psychiatrist, a psychiatric hospital, in 99.9% .9 of the cases, there is not a container for a spiritual experience. So actually, what can happen is that they have spiritual experiences mixed in there, but they don't have the capacity, there's no cultural support for integrating these experiences, learning to manage them. And now we don't know whether these people actually are potentially shamans or not. We don't know. We have never had the opportunity of having, uh, you know, a shaman going through initiation in an MRI and somebody who's going through a psychotic uh, process. In Western psychology, we have uh, the term, you know, Stan Groff and David Lukov uh, use this term and others, spiritual emergence or spiritual emergency. When someone goes through 
experiences that on the face of it look like psychosis that are intense. Uh, there is intense energy uh, that is hard to contain, that is hard to manage. But in the end, the person ends up at a higher level of integration, at a higher level of functioning. This is not always easy to predict. You know, is somebody going to in disintegrate further or is somebody going through an intense process of deconstruction and reconstruction and rebuilds their identity? You know, there are a few factors that uh, are predictors such as the, you know, the life, the support and, and all those kinds of factors that make for that helps people deal with uh, psychological experiences. And that would be helpful. I'm under the impression that your work, the work of the Groffs, is part of a, a larger cultural wave that's taking place right now where uh, the animistic worldview and appreciation for other cultures is, is slowly but surely being integrated into Western society. So there are more and more opportunities for people to sort of live in both worlds simultaneously. I sure hope so. Um, for, for two reasons. For one, you know, they're gifted individuals in any society who have the potential to be healers, to be shamans, uh, whatever label you want to use. So it would be good if those people were to receive support because we know Western medicine doesn't always work. It works in a lot of cases. We also know shamanism doesn't always work. But it works in certain cases and is, can be extremely helpful. So support for individuals to have cultural support for their experience is something that would be really good. And I think you're pointing to a shift that is happen, happening. I, I wish it were a more significant uh, shift. However, shamanism is no longer as bizarre and exotic as it was uh, several decades ago, it is much more accepted. And I think that's a great uh, progress. The second reason why I think uh, this shift is really important is to address our crises, especially our environmental crises, because shamanism, for one, it's pragmatic, does it work? But also it's nature-based, it's nature-connected. So when we're talking about problems in uh, the environment, the shamanic perspective and seeing plants as spirit, you know, the animistic uh, worldview that you were referring to, you know, honoring animals, uh, honoring animals, the spirit of animals, the spirit of the bear, the spirit of the raven, what have you, uh, that shifts our perspective and can help us heal where at the moment we are wreaking uh, tremendous destruction in the world. So that shift in paradigm is really, I think, important for balancing ourselves in the world as our uh, planet presently is, you know, getting destroyed. So I'm hopeful that this is helpful. And I notice, you know, students are very interested in this and they find a relief when they, they hear about this. There is a perspective that addresses both their spiritual needs, but also their desire for connection with nature, et cetera, et cetera. So that, that helps uh, shift things. So I'm optimistic on that count. In Western society, there is, I think you'd have to say, a mystical tradition. And Western mysticism has largely been associated, I think, with the idea of the soul flies up to heaven and communicates with the angels and the, the deities and, and even uh, with, uh, with the ultimate uh, reality with God. But it's sort of transcendental. It's not an earthly spirituality, which sort of puts it in a, a, a distinction to shamanism. I think it does. That is a very important distinction. In Western thinking, in Western spiritual, mystical traditions, transcendence is, is the goal. The spirits in shamanic traditions, they're right there. They're right around us. They're not distant. They're what we're living with. They are 
You know, they can be part of our being. They're right around us. They're there uh, to help us. And so often, you know, in, in Western traditions, you know, we have services. We have things that are done on Sunday morning, say. But in shamanic traditions, prayers, invocations, they're a part of everyday life. At times they happen, you know, I was hanging out uh, in Hopi and watching what was happening. And you almost couldn't tell when there was a shift to a prayer. It was just part of the natural proceedings that were going on. And I think that's that's a different relationship to the sacred, to honoring life, to honoring beauty, where, you know, the spirits that can help us, the spirits uh, that can help us heal are um, right around us. They're right there. An important part of your work uh, associated with your book on ethno-autobiography, I think it's the idea that for each and every one of us, if we go back far enough in our own ancestry, we will find uh, shamanic traditions. That's very important to remember. One of the most profound questions in our current crisis is, how did we get here? And one ans possible answer is to say, well, we lost our shamanic connections. We dissociated from things that are part of our embeddedness in the world around us, part of our intimate contact, our intimate conversation, our nurturing conversation with the world around us, with the spirits around us, with all the beings around us, whether it's a tree in my garden, uh, a rock, um, you know, a pet, bird that flies overhead. So we've lost uh, those uh, connections. And that, you know, understanding this loss, which I actually regard as a trauma, is is really, really important. So when you talk about ethno-autobiography, uh, we are talking about recovering these connections that really have the capacity to nurture us, to make us feel better to heal us. Being out in nature is healing. If I just sit on the beach and listen to the Ciceros of the waves, there is something healing in that. When I listen to uh, the wind in the redwood trees, there is something healing in, in that. So expanding our sense of self outward and opening up strict boundaries thick boundaries of ourselves and allowing the world to enter us. It's kind of like an osmos uh, osmotic uh, relationship where we're a little bit more porous, a little bit more anchored, rooted in the world around us to have this intimate conversation with all the beings around us. There's a tremendous healing capacity in that. And so often you hear shamans say, I wasn't doing the healing. I was just the conduit. It was really the spirits, and that can be the spirit of a mountain, um, like with uh, Florence Jones up here, in, uh, who she was a, a Indian doctor up up north in California. You know, it was the mountains. It was the mountain spirit. It was that conversation, but it can be a conversation with many other beings that can be called upon to help us be in balance. As a parapsychologist, I'm sort of aware of the razor's edge that our particular profession is on and in, in which we have uh, the the barest amount of recognition by the uh, Western academic uh, traditions, even though we apply the scientific method to the study of extrasensory perception and psychokinesis, life after death. And at the same time, the shamanic traditions around the world, the animistic traditions around the world seem to have no problem whatsoever with the many varieties of manifestations of extraordinary experiences that intrigue parapsychologists. And there's a difference between, you know, being a cultural practitioner versus being a scientific practitioner and trying to document uh, something Parapsychology, I think, is in a real uh, predicament because of the phenomena 
that parapsychology studies, it is under this tremendous obligation, you know, weighted down by the burden of having to use a natural science model to, uh, to show phenomena, uh, that are real, uh, that <laughs> happen every day in the world all over. Um, but using a method that actually is, in a sense, you could, I would say, contradictory to what we are looking for. Because in a shamanic world, these are natural phenomena. And a lot of things, psi events, etc., etc., they happen because there is a need, because there is a connection, and it's part of life in that way. When you put the same thing in the laboratory, uh, if you get even a minimal effect, I think that's actually tremendously strong because the conditions are so unnatural, right? But in, uh, you know, in a natural environment where these capacities, uh, these, let's say, parapsychological conduits, uh, capacities are, are needed, they're natural. They're part of what's happening, uh, you know, and they're part of life. They're in that sense, not extraordinary. For us, it looks like it's magic. It's a miracle. But there are miracles in life all the time. And uh, I think parapsychology, because of the paradigm uh, that parapsychology, unfortunately, has to deal with, um, is in a very uh, difficult uh, situation. And, you know, many years ago, I ta uh, taught uh, classes in, in parapsychology, some with uh, Stan Krippner, and it is so difficult to uh, document these phenomena because also when somebody does something in a shamanic ceremony, well, you can't interrupt the ceremony. You can't, you know, you can't create any controlled observations, uh, 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 controlled conditions. You can observe, uh, but it's not anything that in the natural science paradigm would be acceptable. So, um, I kind of feel bad for parapsychology, uh, in, in that sense. So I want to say that everything that has been found, you know, and anybody who is interested, you know, can go to the volumes that say Stan Krippner edited on parapsychological research. Anything that has been found, therefore, actually has much more relevance, much more importance than it seems, even though the effects may seem small, because the conditions on, on, under which many of these phenomena have been uh, documented are so difficult and so unnatural and really contraindicated to have these phenomena happen. Well, and shamans often report experiences, I think, that go beyond anything that's been documented in the parapsychology laboratory. There are occasional field study reports, perhaps. Uh, for example, shape-shifting uh, is something I, I gather is rather uh, commonly associated with various shamanic traditions. Yes, it is. And that's a difficulty this go the difficulty in terms of documenting shamanism goes from shape shifting to simple healing. Most of the evidence is anecdotal. It's stories, it's people who've observed it. Um but it's not in the sense of Western science, you know, hard evidence. And how would you document uh shape shifting? And when people shape shift, they do it, you know, a shaman doesn't do it just for fun and pleasure and say, hey, this is what I can do. A shaman does this to accomplish certain things. Remember, shamanism is pragmatic. It's to help people, to balance things, uh, to make the world better, so to speak. So you don't do these things frivolously. I remember when I attended my very first Parapsychological Association convention in 1973, the presidential address that year was given by Rex Stanford, who was a professor of psychology, and the title of his address was, Are We Scientists or Are We Shamans? And he, he was arguing that we must be scientists uh, and make sure that we don't let any you know, shamanistic abilities that we might have interfere with 
with the results of, of our studies. I tend to think he got it backwards, and I'm under the impression that many parapsychologists today uh, are looking at uh, exploration such as the type in which you engage, becoming initiated into uh, various shamanic rituals to see if that won't help us in our scientific work. Yeah, and I would say, you know, he certainly has it backwards. I would say we need to do both. You know, we have an obligation to document. But with that, really, we need to expand the Western paradigm of science. And some of my work in psychology has been to rethink uh, the approaches, the methodologies, the paradigm of uh, psychology. Because when we go into quantum field theory and those cutting-edge uh, scientific endeavors, then we see that there is a way to bridge things. And, you know, Stanley Krippner in his uh, Realms of Healing a long time ago used quantum theory to explain healing, for example. So they, there are convergences, but the conventional mainstream natural science paradigm is totally inadequate for parapsychology. Quantum field theory and shamanism, shamanic approaches, some shamanic cultural understandings have a convergence. There's a term indigenous science uh, that allows to talk about this from the native side, so to speak. And then we have quantum field theory that uh, comes from the other side. And that's where I see a convergence that is really important because when we as long as we're insisting well it's the natural science uh, paradigm only it's representing things from a distant view only that's the only accepted ex acceptable way of make of doing science uh, then um, we miss out on so much that is important for us as humans that's so important for our well-being for you know, how we can be in the world in, in a good way. I know that in your book, Ethno Autobiography, part of the subtitle refers to decolonization. And of course, we're only about a hundred years, which to me is a short amount of time from the era in which uh, the, the Western countries had colonies throughout what we now think of as the third world. And, and, and we looked down on those people and that created a, a certain arrogance, which it, it seems to me that for for the kind of synthesis that you're describing uh, to occur, and I believe it will occur maybe over the next thousand years or so, hopefully sooner, uh, we have to let go of that arrogance. Yes. That's part, you know, going back to the history of shamanism, that was part of the misunderstanding. People would say, well, these are primitive people, you know. So we can diagnose them. We say, we say they are mentally ill. We have this arrogance of looking down on them. And we, as, uh, you know, in the Western paradigm, post enlightenment, we hold the truth. We know how to get to the truth. And we mistreated traditions that have been around for hundreds and thousands of years and that have helped people. Not always successfully, but that helped people. Uh, and we dismiss them because we say, well, they're a primitive. So we shouldn't even talk about them in psychology. And in, in my textbooks, I talk about, you know, I talk about spiritual tr traditions and religious traditions, which contain tremendous spiritual insights. Yes, they are presented. It, not in textbook fashion. They're very often presented in story fashion. Um, but that doesn't mean that they are useless. They have helped people for hundreds and thousands of, of years. And we are so intent on anything biological. You know, when we look at depression, the only thing we can think about is, well, what's going on with the neurotransmitters? There must be a chemical, Im chemical imbalance. And we, have this reductionistic approach and we don't see what is happening in the life of a person who is depressed. What is their, uh, what are their spiritual needs? What, what is missing? We, we don't look at that holistically and there's a healing power in all of that when we look 
at it from these different angles. And my text on, on ethnobiography is really looking at our self of our, at our identity as, you know, we have a body, which is oftentimes neglected. We have dreams, which is so often neglected. Um, you know, any native person, you know, dreams are very important in their lives. Now we have all these different aspects that are important and that, uh, create, uh, who we are. For me, my commitment is to, to, to living in a decolonial world, meaning outside as best as I can, the paradigm that labels other people as primitive that you know has racial hierarchies uh you know all of this but saying that the practices you called them animism earlier you know of animism of being in the world of 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 shamans those kinds of practitioners that's the decolonial world that is outside that is not even interested in decolonization that is interested in doing it differently and affirming these kinds of practices, uh, you know, these kinds of cultural practices. Not long ago, I did an interview with an attorney, an Irish attorney, James Tunney, about transhumanism. And he uh, has a, a very strong attitude that uh, there is a viewpoint in mainstream Western culture that the human being is sort of a machine. In fact, sometimes it's, we're, it's said we're nothing more than a machine. And it seems as if the, an awakening to the possibilities expressed by animistic cultures uh, real, would help us to realize that we are so much larger than that. Our models tend to come from, you know, for what is a human being, tend to come from whatever is the latest technological development, you know. So, uh, there, there is machines and then there is, you know, is the brain a computer? Uh, and all these are metaphors that are ultimately problematic. Why isn't an anthill a metaphor for who we are as human beings or a tree or any of these? And of course, you know, some people who are working in alternative uh, traditions are using those uh, as metaphors. And the view, you know, which Freud had, you know, he, Freud had this hydraulic model of, uh, you know, our drives that need to be released. It was a very physical model about how the psyche works, um, which, of, of course, you know, he did groundbreaking work. He, you know, looked at the unconscious in a way nobody had done before, but it created a very limited model in terms of who we are as human beings. So seeing ourselves as part of a web that reaches out into different worlds, worlds with plants, animals, uh, rocks, rivers, oceans, reaches out in the different spiritual worlds that reaches down into the earth, I think is a better way of talking about us as human beings we can shut ourselves off as modernity has done. You know, we have dissociated from these connections, but we can recover them. It's, it's part of our human potential. This is one of the major shifts is the emphasis on our left brain processes, you know, which are extremely powerful in terms of focusing and, and all of that and representing things. But we've neglected the integrative functions of the, of the right hemisphere and recovering the balance between the hemispheres, which is what trances do in a way. And, and recovering our connections with, with imagery. You know, one of the things, a lot of the shamanic language is about, you know, what people see. You know, they don't just see, they feel, they smell, but s the visual element, which, you know, is so dominant for us humans is, is so important. The visual element is the programming language of the, the limbic system, uh, the paleomammalian brain. So when we dream, we have all these images, which at times can be very confusing. And we say, well, that was bizarre. What was that? And so we need to interpret it because it doesn't work always in the language uh, of, of words. 
but it has a lot of emotional power that is associated with images. So that's where we need to do uh, the bridging uh, between the different parts of our brains and synchronize our hemispheres. And that's trances is one of the ways of doing it. And of course, inducing trances can be done in all kinds of ways, fasting, drumming, dancing, there are uh, a gazillion ways to achieve that integration, you know, art, etc. But when we talk about trance states, that would seem to be the specialty of shamans through, as you point out, fasting, drumming, dancing. That is the specialty of uh, shamans. But many of us, you know, seek it out uh, naturally. Um, you know, we listen to a certain type of, of, of music. We sit under a tree. We gaze out into the ocean. Now, that may not be as intense a trance state as a shaman might go through in a ritual where they go deep, where they might go into either a religious trance or a, po a possession trance. But uh, we, we, are, we are trance deprived on the whole. But why do we have the popularity, say, of ecstasy, right? Of wild dancing. That's a search for trance. Grateful Dead concerts. You know, all these are expressions of the need to have these integrative states that help us. I just used the term religious trance and possession trance, so let me just explain very briefly. And uh, that is a distinction uh, that has been made uh, that seems to be clear-cut, but really, in reality, you know, the, these can be uh, a little bit uh, enmeshed. But in a religious trance, uh, the, the practitioner goes, connects with that spiritual realm, that visual realm, and pretty much observes and remembers everything, can act in that realm, but is conscious, remembers. In possession trance, the way it's commonly defined, the person, you know, leaves, my sense of identity leaves, and something else takes over. A spirit takes over and uses my body to do something. So th those are two types of uh, a trance. And, and they can sort of go hand in hand and, you know, as the depth of the trance and the quality of the trance uh, shifts. Well, you mentioned... What young people engage in Grateful Dead concerts, of course, is part of my generation, but the and your generation. But I see young people going to raves and getting involved in electronic music and techno music. But I'm under the impression that in the human life cycle, it is the young people who sort of naturally gravitate towards these altered states of consciousness. And then as, as they get married and start raising children and have a nine to five job, you know, they lose some of that passion. I think that may be one of the problems in our culture is, is that we Forget how to stay young. This leads back to we have a lack of cultural practices that support that. And I, I wish there was more. I, I have a sense that younger people are more impatient and uh, sort of more insistent that there actually is that space to explore uh, these trans states. I think that there's sort of a growth there. Um but I think that's a real problem. We are also religious, spiritual people, so we are hungry for those kinds of experiences. And when we don't have them, uh, you know, we, we're deficient. It's like our, uh, our meals are not nutritious enough. We have no cultural way at this moment to sort of support that. We, 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 we don't. Pointing to it, I think there, there are, you know, more and more people. I think it's still a minority, but more people who talk about it, who talk about the trans deprivation, who talk about uh, the possibilities, the, the human potential that we have, because everybody can go into these states. It's, it's something that's trainable, something that can be, can be learned. And it is, uh, you know, beneficial for uh, people. Well, Jürgen Kramer, this has been a very significant conversation. I'm delighted to have this time with you. I think you're pointing toward a gaping hole in 
Western culture, and I think that your work is very constructive in terms of finding responsible ways, uh, knowledgeable ways, wise ways of filling that hole. So, Jürgen, thank you so much for being with me. Thanks again, Jeffrey. I enjoyed this conversation. Thanks for uh, having me. Uh, these are topics that are close to my heart and that I love talking about. So, thank you. I hope to have you back on New Thinking Aloud more often in the future to continue the discussion. And for those of you watching or listening, thank you for being with us.